Hey everyone, Ro here. Well, the first round is over and the results are in. Our chapter war continues and the quest to decide the strongest chapter. From day one in our first contest, the Ultramarines demolished the Blood Ravens. In a bit of a landslide, actually, with just under 70% of the vote. The Salamanders weren't too far behind in their own victory as they knocked out the Iron Hands, with a little over 60% in favour of them getting the win. Also the first contest to go against the way I personally would have voted. Next we had the Black Templars, as expected, steamrolling through the Crimson Fists, with a shy under 80% of the vote which honestly was still more than I thought the Crimson Fists were going to get. Through no fault of their own, they really did have an uphill battle. Moving on to day two, in what I expected to be a closely fought encounter, we had the Blood Angels going against the Astartes Destroyers, the Minotaurs. And well, the Blood Angels absolutely ran away with it with over 80% of the vote. A little Blood Angel's favouritism there, or just supreme confidence in Dante. I think the Minotaur's lack of spotlight may have cost them a little in this one, as surely that should have been a fiercely contested fight. Next, the Dark Angels had a fairly convincing win over the Raven Guard, with over 60% of the votes themselves. The Space Wolves proved too much for the Sons of Chagoris, as 70% of the voting favoured the Sons of Rus. And in our closest contest yet, the Imperial Fists held off the Karkaradon Astra, with a 60-40% to vote. No surprises in the winners there, though I will admit I'm a little surprised how convincingly some of the victories came. I think we may see some closer results now we move on to some more heavy hitting decisions. And with that in mind today, that means we have the Ultramarines moving on to face the newly arrived Flesh Terrors. The Salamanders once more taking on the superior numbered force in the Black Templars. The biggest matchup yet as the Blood Angels take on the Dark Angels in an Angels of Death grudge match. And finally, the Space Wolves demolish, oh no wait sorry, Freudian slip, the Space Wolves face the Imperial Fists. So, without further ado, let's begin with the Ultramarines against the Flesh Terrors. Well, it wasn't much of a surprise to see the Ultramarines ease through their first match. For all the unique talents of the Blood Ravens, it was a hard ask for them to get past the boys in blue. And now, well, they have a very different proposition in the Flesh Terrors. The Flesh Terrors' reputation for savagery is legendary. As ferocious as their forebears in the Blood Angels are, the Flesh Terrors truly are a level above. Vicious, brutal, relentless. None of it truly captures the chapter completely. For in battle, the Flesh Terrors are all of these things, and more. The truth of the matter is, the Flesh Terrors' gene seed suffers mutation more so than the rest of their fellow brethren, making them even more vulnerable to Sanguinius's flaw, and more immersed within his rage. It's historically left the Flesh Terrors in a difficult position, maligned by their allies, feared by those they protect, and facing an ever more real threat of extinction. By the time that Gabriel Seth assumed the position of Chapter Master, the Flesh Terrors were on the brink. There seemed no possible salvation, no chance of survival. However, Seth refused 
to let his chapter die in shame, and by ensuring his chapter fought alone, reaching war zones before any other, Seth managed to carve the Flesh Terror's reputation anew. For all the good that Seth achieved for the spirit of the chapter, however, he couldn't stop their physical slide towards their doom. That was only prevented, or at least delayed, by the arrival of the Primaris. Initially hesitant of these new creations, Seth ultimately accepted them into the chapter, finally seeing the ranks of the Terrors swell. For a time at least, as the Primaris have now been revealed as no more resistant to the floor than the firstborn before them. And so the Terrors slide towards damnation once more continues. Fighting strength wise that does make it a little tricky to say. While the Flesh Terrors were fully replenished in the aftermath of the devastation, in reality it was just an influx of bodies, and their increased rate of loss to the rage continues. For me, I'd say the Terrors are still now comfortably within fighting strength, but it's only heading one way. Considering the Ultramarines have just prevailed within the Plague Wars themselves, where they undoubtedly would have suffered losses against Nurgle and the Death Guard, you could say this may be a fairly even contest, or at the most a small numbers advantage to the Ultramarines. Tactics wise, we know the Flesh Terrors are going all out, playing to their strengths. Assault. We also know one of the unfortunate benefits of the Flesh Terror's flaw is their Death Company is a permanent unit, so the Ultramarines would be extremely hard pressed to stand before it. Perhaps this is where the greatness of Marnius Kalgar may truly shine. Sure, he could go like for like in a show of bravado but I think it's far more likely he'd play to his strengths and use this aggression against the Flesh Terrors, adopting a more ranged offensive. Remember, the Lord Commander Gilliman is not included in the Ultramarines here. We're just considering the chapter itself. The advantage has to go to the Flesh Terrors up close. But with the leadership of Kalgar, you have to give him the nod tactically. Maybe this all depends on how you rate Gabriel Seth himself, whether or not you believe he'd be able to pull something out the bag to catch the Ultramarines by surprise. For me, considering Seth's legendary rage in his own right, I'm not sure he could. Could the Flesh Terrors just go all out and overwhelm the Ultramarines? Well, yes, it is possible. But in turn, could the Ultramarines sit back and use the advantage they have? A clear and calm mindset. Yes. For me, I just think that that's probably the more likely. So undoubtedly blooded and battered, the Ultramarines would get my vote. But as always, it's your vote that matters. Next we have the Salamanders taking on the Black Templars. Well, look, I had the Iron Hands getting the win over the Salamanders, so I'm not going to write them off here. However, most certainly they do have the odds stacked against them. For my mind, there's three main factors that are going to decide it either way. The first is resilience. As we discussed Monday, the Salamanders are renowned for their resilience, inherited from their father Vulcan, able to shake off blows a normal Astarte may not. It gives them the advantage over most of the opponents they face, and indeed it could well here. You'd expect a salamander to be bigger, stronger, tougher, 
than your average Templar. However, faith can be a surprising thing. The power of faith, while no physical asset, not a thing you can feel in your hand, can perhaps be the most powerful tool of all. And the Templars have that in abundance. The faith of the Templars is absolute. It encompasses everything they do. A Templar fueled by his faith, certain his actions are blessed by the Emperor, could well push through pain he otherwise may not. This could well end up to be a battle of mind over matter. The second factor, leadership. Here we have two names of renown going against the other. High Marshal Helbrecht of the Templars and Tushan of the Salamanders. One of the things I've always wished about the lore is that we got to see more of the other first founding chapter masters. So often we hear of Calgar, Dante, Asriel, but rarely the likes of Tushan. But even still, this man's name lives on. His actions that we know speak for themselves. And the respect he has earned is clearly well deserved. Tushan of the Salamanders is a great chapter master. As we have spoken about already, he has earned the respect of Dante upon Armageddon. He has led his entire chapter against the legions of Corn, And he has held his chapter together in the face of rising darkness. Chapter Master Tushan is a son Vulcan would be proud of. Opposite him, we have High Marshal Helbrecht, most likely a more famous name outside the law, his tales of achievement more widely told. And you wouldn't necessarily be wrong to do so, for Helbrecht is an undaunted hero of the Imperium, a man who has conversed with the Lord Commander himself, who personally hunts the Stormlord Imotech, not to mention the Orc Warlord Gazkol Fracker. These two would be undoubtedly a battle of wills, a figurative hammer against the anvil. The question we really need to ask is in this mental battle, which of the two would come out victorious? And thirdly, numbers. In any war, one of the most defining factors will always come down to simple numbers. Which side has the advantage? The Salamanders, as we spoke about previously, are a small chapter. They have only seven companies by the orders of Vulcan, and they are structured as the Codex decrees, which makes it extremely likely the Salamanders number less than your standard Codex chapter, possibly by even as much as 300 Marines. And that's before we consider losses sustained from current fighting. The Black Templars, on the other hand, have never embraced the Codex, and so number far higher than the supposed Thousand Marine mandate. While the official number is not known, I personally prefer to lean on the older information that we have, around five to 6,000 Marines. Now, as I said in their first battle, I would find it incredibly unlikely that Helbrecht could actually call this amount to his banner in any relative speed. Firstly, the Templar Crusades are always locked within their own grand campaigns, making any immediate retreat unlikely. Secondly, they are guided just as much, if not more so, by their visions from the Emperor than any order from Helbrecht. Some, as we have seen before, have ignored his orders completely. 
And thirdly, the Imperium is a mess. The warp is in turmoil, even within the relative safety of Imperium Sanctus. With the Crusades scattered across the entire galaxy, it's a monumental task for Helbrecht's messages to even reach half the Crusades out there. Now, with those reasons in mind, I'd still expect the Templars to field well over a thousand Marines, most probably still into the several. And that puts a huge advantage into the Templars column. How this contest plays out for me depends on how you feel about these factors. Resilience, leadership, and size. How do I side? Well, for all Tushan's greatness, for all the heart of the Salamanders, there's just no way I can see them getting past the size difference this time. The Black Templars would absolutely get the win. Moving on, we have the Angels of Death grudge match, as the Blood Angels take on the Dark Angels. Now this is the most interesting one yet. Both incredibly popular chapters. Both with legendary leaders. Both with insanely popular Primarchs. And now we are pitting the chapters face to face. This really does feel like a take your pick. Size wise we know both of these chapters adhere to the Thousand Marine limit. The Blood Angels, while having been rebuilt after the Devastation, are expected to be slightly below a full chapter, simply due to their fighting situation and the continued effects of the floor. The Dark Angels we know accepted their Primaris reinforcements from Rebute Gilliman himself, and with their Pura Gene Seed, don't have any particular traits draining their resources. Yes, the rock was invaded in the event that Luther escaped, but there's no real reference to any major damage incurred during this event. More so, it was a distraction to get Luther out. So, I would give the Dark Angels the slight number advantage here. Now, Force of Arms and Weaponry is a little more tricky. The Blood Angels have been rebuilt as a chapter, so you'd expect them to be fully complemented with all new equipment Belisarius Call can supply. Indeed, we saw the Mechanicum beginning their rebuild immediately. We also know as Walden of Imperium Nihilus, Dante is assembling a battle fleet of his own recruiting in any suitable vessels he manages to encounter. So the Blood Angels are in the process of assembling a fairly substantial fleet. The problem is, the Dark Angels have always had one. The first were blessed with their armada from their very creation, having more Gloriana-class battleships than any other legion. Many of those original vessels still remain in action to this day, such as the Invincible Reason. As a result of the fall of Caliban, they became a fleet-based chapter, which added the enormous rock to their flotilla. You're not going to look forward to a fleet battle against the Dark Angels, no matter who you are. And as we've mentioned before, within the bowels of the rock, there's some weaponry known to no other. There is no doubt the Dark Angels can bring the firepower to the battlefield when they want to. Both chapters have a legendary leader, the charismatic Dante, the more subdued Asriel. Experience here undoubtedly has to go to Dante, but again, with Dante's wounds still causing him issues, with neither of them having crossed the Rubicon yet, you'd have to give Asriel the advantage in combat. This really is a tough one. 
even if you tried using the warden roll for some extra oomph. Well, Asriel can call on the rest of the Unforgiven. It's a really tight contest no matter how you look at it. Maybe the defining trait in this one is going to come down to their departures from the Codex, the Blood Angel's Sanguinary Guard, and their Death Company, the Dark Angel's Death Wing, and their Raven Wing. Which aspects of these chapters do you put more faith in? For me, if this was the chapter's pre-Dark Imperium, I'd give my vote to the Blood Angels, and probably fairly easily, before the war with the Tyranids really wore them down, when they had the likes of Tycho in all his glory. While they have been rebuilt from that, as I said yesterday, they are almost a new chapter, with less than 200 firstborn marines left. Now probably even less. It's quite a prominent narrative from Dante's perspective within the novel Darkness in the Blood, about how these new Primaris don't fight like Blood Angels yet, how they don't understand what it means to have the blood of Sanguinius, all the blesses and curses that that brings, how they are still very much learning. For me, the Dark Angels Primaris don't have that curve to go through, Sure, they may not be told some hush-hush secrets. They may not be allowed to go down certain corridors. But they get taught to fight like Dark Angels, from the off. There's no instinctual learning process that they have to go through. And so, I think my vote here, despite my love for Dante, has to go to Asriel and the Dark Angels. And finally, moving on, we have the Sons of Rus against the Sons of Rogal Dawn, as the Space Wolves face the Imperial Fists. Now, I think this one is pretty clear cut, but I'm going to, aren't I? But I'll try and keep this clear and logical. The advantage for the Space Wolves is quite obviously their huge numbers advantage. As we know, the Space Wolves have never embraced the Codex Astartes. Their great companies have always numbered well over any theoretical limit. And despite the constant events and wars grinding Grimnar's numbers down, Gilliman has given them new life. In his need for the Space Wolves to cancel out the growing Orc threat, Gilliman released thousands of Primaris and new technology into the care of Logan Grimnar. The Wolves of Rus were reborn as a figurative legion once more. Now some of those Primaris were given to struggling new successors, such as the Wolfspear chapter for example as Grimnar attempted to foster bonds with his new kinsmen. However, he more than had the manpower to do so, and the Space Wolves undoubtedly still number into the several thousand. Now, the advantage they have over the Black Templars, for example, in this regard, is that the Space Wolves aren't a fleet-based chapter. They aren't spread all over the galaxy. They have Fenris, and so Grimnar has full control of his chapter. While the Imperial Fists are ready and able to replace any losses quickly and efficiently, they always remain at the Codex 1000, so quite simply they are going to be vastly outnumbered. I also don't think the Imperial Fist tactic of hunkering down would be to their benefit either, as the Wolves always prefer to go straight for the throat. Now, that said, where the Imperial Fists have their own big advantage would be in the Void, with the Phalanx. 
In any fleet-based battle, the phalanx would undoubtedly be the dominating factor. You'd be hard-pressed to find anything within the Space Wolf fleet that could stand up to such a vessel. And so the Space Wolves would have to be smart on how they went about it. But here's where maybe another Space Wolf advantage comes into play. For they have the Great Wolf, Logan Grimnar. Grimnar went to war against the Inquisition and the Grey Knights in the Mumps of Shame. The Inquisition. And he did not lose. If anything, he gave them a complete runaround and he came out looking the better. While he may not be able to destroy the phalanx, I'm not even sure he'd attempt to try, and he'd absolutely have something in mind to deal with it. But regardless, the Imperial Fists would have the advantage in any fleet encounter. Now, as we discussed previously, the Imperial Fists do have a new chapter master, Gregor Desian. And while in time he could prove to be the greatest chapter master since Dawn himself, you would have to consider Grimnar the more experienced. Now they do of course have Captain Lysander still within their ranks, who is an undoubted hero of the Imperium, but you do have to think they'd be in a far better position had he accepted the position of chapter master himself. And you want to talk about experience within a chapter? Well, there's no trumping Bjorn the Fell Handed. This guy's been around since the heresy itself. The first great wolf, after Russ's disappearance. Again, admittedly, I am biased. I'm Wolflord Rowe, but I just think the Space Wolves have too much going for them over the fists. It's not just the sheer size of the wolves, it's the fact that they were made for this very purpose. But as always, it's not up to me. It's your vote that matters. As always, I'll have a link to the polls in the description for you to vote. And for those that find it easier, there will be polls also up on my Instagram, Wolflord Row. There's most certainly some grudge matches here I am looking to see the results for. So make sure your vote is counted. But as always everyone, that's it for today and I am off. I'll see you tomorrow with the results and the semi-finals.